next matter to come before the court is Hack versus Keller. assignments of error, which are interrelated. Um, basically, the trial court uh, has a 60B in front of it regarding a stipulation. And I, I cite various case law where courts have said that is the proper vehicle to try and vacate a stipulation if it was erroneously made. Um, this appears to be something where the, the trial court seems to understand that the stipulation, the effect of the stipulation was not understood by both sides. Um, and I, I cite case law on that that seems, this doesn't come up very often, but I don't see any case law to the contrary saying that you shouldn't vacate a stipulation if it wasn't knowingly, voluntarily, intelligently made. Uh, I think Mr. Keller's trial counsel was very candid in saying he didn't understand the effect of, of a stipulation saying there couldn't be any unequal contribution, any evidence of unequal contribution made at the trial. And if that evidence can't be put forth in the trial, then there's really no reason for a trial. It's just going to be a partition of the property. We're going to sell everything, add everything up, and you get 50%, I get 50%, and we're done. So why, you know, there isn't really any dispute. And there was a counterclaim here where Keller files for various tort claims, including unjust enrichment. Well, you can't have unjust enrichment if there isn't any evidence of unequal contribution to the property. So in effect, by the, the trial court has pretty much said that the way we interpret this stipulation is, is almost like a 41A of the, of the case, that you know, we're going to go in and have this trial, we're going to agree that she put in 50% and you put in 50%, and there's no issues of fact, it either should have been summary judgment or out, or I don't know why we waste time on a trial. There are so many layers to this case yes. <laughs> that my head starts spinning yes. in regard to where to even begin, because Obviously, there's an argument that it's not a final bill order. Yeah. Then you're like, well, if it is a final bill order, then there's an argument that it may be um, an improper appeal because you can't use 60B as a substitute for appeal, and and so you missed your appeal opportunity. There's the magistrate level as opposed to the trial court level. What was objected to? Then you get into the 60B. There's the timeliness issue. So, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things. So can you kind of, as they say, unwrap that a little bit for us or unpack it? Well, procedurally, I, I will say this. Um, certainly there is a risk in not filing a 60B and an appeal because the 60B is denied. Uh, you don't appeal it. Uh, you show up for trial, and the court says, well, there's no issues. You know, I can't remember the date of the trial, but let's say it's two months subsequent. There's no issues here. You get 50%. You get 50%. Mr. Keller says, well, that's, that's gross injustice. I mean, she didn't contribute any to this property. We were never married. She doesn't have any right to this house, let alone 50%. You file an appeal at that point, and it's quite possible you say, hey, you blew your chance. When this stipulation wasn't contested and the denial of the motion to vacate wasn't contested, that was outcome determinative. So if you don't appeal that issue, you know, the case, the case is over. Um, but there were two remaining causes of action, correct? Well, and that's correct, Your Honor. Civil Rule 54 language. Well, that, that's that's correct. And I think at some point trial counsel seems to ask for some some Civil Rule 54 language to, to appeal it then. I don't think the trial court was interested in giving that uh, to Mr. Keller's counsel. But, but you have this problem where if the stipulation is, as the trial court intended it and how the trial court thought it was the effect of it, there's really, there's really nothing to litigate. I mean, it, pre it pretty much terminates the, the litigation. Now, now, Judge Carr, I think you're exactly right. This procedurally, this is sort of a Gordian knot. Um, I can't really, you know, say otherwise. Um, but the question is, if you don't file a 60B 
and you go forward and you end up with this adverse judgment of splitting 50-50, you say, well, you should have filed a 60-B. If it's denied, you don't appeal it. Why didn't you appeal the denial of 60-B, the stipulation that decides all the facts of the case? If the stipulation was simply that the property was held in both parties' names equally, then all remaining causes of action go away if it's equal. Right. So what was the intent then of the stipulation to do if it wasn't to resolve all the remaining issues? I, I, unfortunately, I think the record is pretty muddled on that. I mean, the, the trial uh, counsel goes at you know, length in the transcript saying what he, he didn't think the stipulation was, but he didn't really come out and say what he really thought it was. And he does say that Mr. Keller never saw it, Mr. Keller never reviewed it or signed it. It was just the counsel doing that. What those, what those two attorneys, what meeting of the minds there was, I have no idea. But the deed itself stated that they were both... It, it did, but of course there's an affidavit in the record that the deed is essentially fraudulent, that they never were married, that Ms. Hack said they were married so that she could get 50% claim on the, on the house. Now why that wasn't litigated more by trial counsel, I, I can't answer that. Well, did your client ever sign any affidavit saying that he was unaware of uh, what she was doing or that the deed said that they were married? There, there is an affidavit in the record from Mr. Keller saying we were never married. And right. anyone that says that we were married is you know, mistaken. Um, but that's I, different from saying that I was unaware that the deed said that we were married. Well, it's true. That, 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 that's certainly true. And, and certainly you could raise that to a defense if it was fraud. Is there some statute of limitations or something that is run on the, on the fraud? Unfortunately, this wasn't really litigated as a really as an underlying fraud case. And I, the, the case is how we have it today. You, you know, I mean, would that have been my choice? No, I think I would have said it was more of a fraud case, but you have one party saying we were married, I'm entitled to 50% of the house, 50% of the contents of the house, um, and then on the other side, we weren't married. I mean, this is something that's pretty easy to clarify. It's kind of a red herring anyway, since two unmarried people can both co-own the property in 50% portions anyway. If, if, there, if there's a purchase agreement or there's some sort of con contractual uh, but that's certainly certainly correct, but I mean the whole point of, of Mr. Keller's counterclaims are this this is an unequal that she's not entitled to 50% of the property So if there was some contract somewhere saying well look we were joint Purchasers of the property or some other contract between them then that would have been produced and it'd be a relatively simple litigation um, Again going back to Judge Carr's point the procedural history in this case is a mess um, And I, you know, this is this is what we get um, but if the, the key issue is if you have a stipulation that is made and prior to resolution of the case you go to trial, one side says, hey, that's not what I thought that stipulation is, whether it's a civil case or a criminal case, um, you know, what is the proper thing to do? Um, you know, it looks like filing a 60B motion is the proper uh, vehicle to try and remove that stipulation. What about the timeliness of the uh, 60B motion? Well, that's a different issue. Some months after uh, the stipulation, Your Honor, that that is a that is a good question too. And say, why didn't trial counsel get on this as soon as it was brought to his attention? I, I don't know if there's much of that in the in the transcript. Um, you know, certainly this case has been going on a very long time, and there's many many issues of what could have been a very simple case. Um, but I don't think, in Judge Collier's opinion, he really he doesn't really get into the, the timeliness issue. I mean, it's certainly a legitimate issue um, to ask why, why is it being filed now. Certainly, the, the sooner the better. The worst thing that could have been done, I think, is to, is to not file a 60B, proceed to total resolution of the case, and then ask to vacate you know, a judgment awarding Ms. Hack 50% of, of whatever uh, dollar amount there, there was. So, trial, trial counsel certainly well, one, it's good if you have your stipulation read by your client before you agree to it. That's number one. That I think he kind of admitted that maybe he should have done it that way. And then certainly you, you went on to file 60B as soon as you, it came to your attention what the effect was. I believe there was a hearing where Judge Collier says, well, you know, we got the stipulation, so we're not going to have any evidence about any unequal contribution to the property. And that is what read, finally, trial counsels woke up and said, oh, wait a second. Well, then... There's no way we can win this case. How long after that was the um, motion? 
Your Honor, I think, I think it was, uh, I don't want to tell the court it was the wrong date, but I think it was relatively a, a period of months a, after it came to trial counsel's attention that if we can't produce evidence of un, unequal contribution, then there's, we have no chance of winning this case, and then they filed a 60B. And I, you know, the trial court didn't seem to indicate that trial counsel was trying to mislead the court or saying, no, you understood exactly what the stipulation was. I mean, the trial court in the, in the transcript seems to say, yeah, I guess you really didn't, I don't think you did understand what the stipulation was going to do, but I'm not going to vacate it anyway. And so at that point, you think, geez, you know, do we want to sit and, and wait and, until the, you know, the, the trial and then try and appeal it, or do you want to, this is, this is the whole case. I mean, the stipulation is the whole case. I mean, it would be similar to a criminal motion to suppress. If the evidence can't come in, there's no way we can win our case. And so we're going to do a, you know, like a 12K uh, appeal to use a criminal route. Um, unless there's any other questions, I reserve the balance of my time. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. I'm William Young, counsel for the plaintiff, uh, Appley, in this matter, along with co-counsel Jared Hoover. Uh, I will address uh, initially the issue of whether or not this court has jurisdiction to hear this appeal and, and in a rare moment for me I, I think I am conceding the fact that this case is properly before this court uh, on this appeal because the uh, stipulated order partition was in fact a final appeal of order. Uh, I found no precedent uh, for that in this court. Uh, however, uh, the third, the seventh, uh, have addressed that on a, a number of occasions uh, and have found that it is a final appealable order because it does make the determination as to the relative um, entitlements uh, of both parties. Um, also... You're saying it's a final appealable order? The stipulation. The stipulation is a final appealable order. Uh, or I shouldn't say final appealable order, a final order. You have to have the partition being a final order to begin with. Correct. Okay. And then the motion to vacate would be vacate the final order. In this case, the motion to vacate even misses the order that it should have been appealing. Well, that's um, what I'm getting all confused about again. Uh, let's, let's go through that. Go ahead. On September the 16th of 2011, this case was started by the filing of the complaint. And by the way, in response to your uh, noting that it is a red herring about whether they were married or not, we have never entered any evidence of the sort. My client has never alleged uh, that she was married. There apparently was a mistake made by the scrivener of the original deed. Then there's an answer. We have an amended complaint. We have uh, amended uh, answers and cross claims. And on August 23rd of 2012, that's when the parties not the judge, but the parties submitted their stipulated order of partition, which the judge merely approved once it was submitted to him. He had no input in the content of that order. That's critical. We then had a commissioner's report about six months later, and because neither party elected to purchase uh, based on the determination of value by the commissioner, um, we moved to uh, have the court sell the property. And at that time, the magistrate decided that the parties had a 50-50 entitlement to that property and that it was, in fact, a final appeal of order. That was on July the 25th of 2013. That's the problem that the appellant has. He doesn't have a problem with the stipulation. He did it. He did it to himself. Whether he made a mistake or not in his interpretation, he has to live with that. But what he's really saying in his motion to vacate is that the judge got it wrong that it shouldn't be 50-50. But he never objected to that magistrate's decision. He never uh, appealed the court's December 9th, December 9, 2013 decision incorporating and approving of that magistrate's decision. So we don't get a motion to vacate until March of 2014. This case is going on five years now. And all because the appellant is saying, I didn't know what I was doing, and so I should get to do it all over again. Well, it's, it's so clear 
That's the reason why you can't use a 60B motion to avoid the consequences of failing to appeal a case. You have to appeal the right thing, and you have to do it in a timely manner. We would submit that even if there were a proper uh, element of 60B here, it would be the first element, B1. It was a mistake. Um, and under those circumstances, as Judge Moore pointed out, it's certainly not timely to appeal more than a year or file your motion to vacate more than a year after that mistake was made. Well, Council, let's, go, let's go back before we get into that. Where was the final appeal of the order that he should have appealed? The stipulated order of petition on August 23rd, 2012. And there How are can you appeal something you stipulate to? That's his problem. Uh, as I say, well, all of these... Remedy, all, yeah. Well, the, how can you have a remedy for something that he did to himself? We have to have some finality on that. Well, that's just like saying... Wait a second. Let's just go through this, okay? Because I like to think here and see how you can figure it all out. If, let's say it's a um, agreed upon settlement entry, which is not that much different, right? You couldn't appeal an agreed upon settlement entry. You moved to vacate it, wouldn't you? I don't think you can you can appeal or move to vacate either one of those. If we you would, say it's fraudulently entered into, if you say that whatever, there's there's all kind of case law where you can move to vacate a settlement entry, agree upon settlement entry. If there were errors and in the case law if that was cited, if under duress or whatever, that's not on the record at all. I'm not saying that, but. I'm just trying to get and they a starting could have done point. that. You're I'm, right. I'm trying to get a starting point as to where we begin. And you're saying he should have appealed, or they should have appealed, whatever, I can't think who's right now. They should have appealed the stipulated judgment entry. And I'm saying, how could they appeal something they stipulated to? I agree with you that, that they should simply could. They could have used the motion to vacate once they learned the consequences of that. But that would have been in respect to the magistrate's decision that was eventually adopted by the court back in December 2013. They never appealed that. So and that's they, where you're saying the error lie. They should have appealed the magistrate's determination. Or and he said right in there. Not the magistrate's determination. They could have objected to that, but they could have appealed then the court's right. adoption of the magistrate's and determination. And it's their inattention to what they're signing to begin with. It's not fraud. They've never argued that it was fraud. And in fact, the cases that they've cited where the stipulations were inaccurately incorporated into a final court's decision that were permitted to be reviewed. So in on appeal, what would they have said? That the stipulation, that the magistrate misinterpreted the stipulation? Only if they appealed the magistrate's decision, which they could not, because they never objected to it, and no, the I court don't. adopted it. So <laughs> at every instance, how many strikes do they get before well, this court get... says, we're done with you because you're so inept, you can't do it right? They did well, it right. I'm just trying to get an answer here, though. Okay, so if we're looking at the magistrates, I understand that they may not have been successful on appeal if they didn't object to the magistrates' findings or opinion, but I'm just asking procedurally and jurisdictionally, they should have appealed your saying after the court adopted the magistrates' decision. I would argue that if they had any chance at all, that would have been the time and the place to have done it. And then they would have tried to argue know that they may not have objected, but they would have tried to argue that the magistrate misinterpreted the stipulation. It, they could argue that. It, it would be unsuccessful well, because not, it's quite I'm clear. I'm that right. I'm you know, just talking about where we're, and that's how I started this whole thing by saying, is it an untimely appeal? Is it a premature appeal? Is it this? Is it that? Whatever. Or do we get to the merits? Uh, well, we don't get to the merits because those have already been determined uh, long ago and they haven't been able to bring those in the appropriate well, fashion. Well, I mean, I the merits of the 60 day, that's what Right, I mean. right. Well, had they done it right, they, they would have at least moved to vacate the court's order adopting that magistrate decision, not the stipulated order. If we can't have finality as to stipulated entries of any kind, particularly where the parties have never argued that it was anything but their own mistaken belief, uh, you're going to see a lot of us well, in the court of appeals. Well, counsel, you're not. I assume you're not doubting or not contesting that there's all kinds of case law vacating stipulated entries. That's correct, but so not under. Maybe uh, not under these circumstances. That's but it's subject to vacating. That's, that's correct, Your Honor. So with that, we would uh, argue to the court that this stipulated entry 
was in fact a final appeal to order that could have been appealed from. It was not. Uh, we have the court's interpretation of that through the magistrate's decision, which was not objected to and adopted by the court and never appealed from. And now we get the motion to vacate going clear back to the stipulated order, which was something that they had agreed to to begin with. So if the court wants to open up Pandora's box and allow any counsel to come along and say, well, I didn't know what I was doing, um, you're going to get to see an awful lot of us in, in this court. Well, but that's a different issue, I think, isn't it? Because the issue there is, were they justified? Did they have the grounds for a 60B1 or a 60B5? Which is a different issue as to whether or not um, they've lost their right to appeal or they should have used, they can't use the 60B as a substitute for appeal. When you're talking about opening Pandora's box, it's a matter of, um, I think the issue there is whether or not you can prove a 60B, uh, vaca the vacation under 60B as just that you didn't understand uh, a stipulation. And that's why you would be seeing me every time I didn't get a ruling in my favor, because I didn't understand that that was what the consequence of my own action was going to be. This is not an occasion where the parties reached stipulations, submitted those to the judge, and then the judge got it wrong when he tried to incorporate those stipulations into his order. We prepared the order and submitted it to the judge merely for his clerical approval of it. So Can now... Can you speak to the issue with regard to um, the final, uh, whether this is the final appeal of the order, the fact that there are two remaining causes of action? Well, that's where, as I indicated, I'd have to concede that this is a final appealable order based upon the precedent that exists in the 3rd District and the 7th District, which I didn't cite in the brief because we had argued, quite candidly, we had argued against that. But it appears that because of the uniqueness of a partition order, um, they, other courts have determined that that would be final. And the rest Without of the... regard to the fact that there are other... The, the court considered that those um, are ministerial actions that you just have to wrap up that original order of partition. Well, if you concede that it is a final appealable order, now, like I said, the other attorney, I'll start picking it. <laughs> if you concede that it's a final appealable order, then you really your only argument is that 60B can't be used as a substitute for appeal. Well, it's not my only argument, but it's certainly the best one. Uh, and the one that this court ought to adopt without uh, any further consideration of all the other activity that has gone on in this case, you're absolutely right, John. But then that goes back, as I start going around in circles, because then that goes back to what he should have been moving to vacate and what was the final bill of order. Correct. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. If I could go into the final order real, real fast, I'm looking at Judge Cotter's order that's attached to the brief, and it talks about the claims are on the plaintiff's side, partition, contribution, and accounting, and the defense uh, counterclaims are partition, unjust, enrichment, and conversion. If there really is a stipulation that everyone is entitled to 50-50 of the proceeds, all those claims go away. Uh, I mean, if, if, if we're entitled to, you, I get 50, you get 50, well, your partition's resolved, contribution, accounting, we don't need that, uh, conversion, unjust enrichment, those go away. The whole case goes away, given the stipulation. I want to say one but, thing. But, but, but I thought the same thing when I was reading the briefs, but that doesn't prevent counsel from doing that if they want to. And, and that obviously it's basically a settlement. Th that's exactly right. That's it, which is basically a settlement. And then Mr. Keller's trial counsel, and I think we have to give him some credit for this, rather than try and hide or evade responsibility. I mean, he says I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I didn't realize that's what the stipulation was. And Judge Collier says, you know, Steve, is, is, he's, I think he's trying to be nice. He's like Steve was in the dark about the consequences of joint tenancy and the right of survivorship. He, the, the, the lawyer didn't know what that meant, it, you know, and. And so in that sense, it looks like the judge, the trial judge was going to be favorable, but said, no, you know what, I don't want to get into this. I don't think 60B is the right way to go here. But the case law says that it does, because prior to the denial of the 60B, I think opposing counsel's right. There was nothing to appeal because the court didn't do anything wrong. Opposing counsel didn't do anything wrong. The appellant did something wrong, or appellant's counsel. The appellant counsel entered into a stipulation that he didn't know what it was. 
and it says so in the record, and the trial court says, yeah, you didn't know what that stipulation meant, did you? So until the 60B is denied by the trial court, there's nothing to complain to this court about. You know, complain, I mean, the trial counsel can't file an appeal on himself and say you need to give this guy a, a new lawyer. Well, there's something to complain, isn't there, when the court adopts a magistrate's decision and says, you know, it's 50-50. You know, I think it was the order. I mean, I, I can't explain. I mean, I don't know trial counsel. I don't know what his history is or, or his field of expertise. But it really looks like when, when, the, when the judge says, okay, we're going to do this trial, but you can't bring any evidence of unequal contribution. Wait, what? I can't do that. Then how do we win this case? Well, there's nothing to win. The case is essentially over. And as you say, Judge Carr, it's essentially, a, it's just a, sort of a very uh, a bizarre settlement agreement. And the, oh geez, is that what it, is that what we did? Oh my God! Well, I better file a motion to vacate. I had no idea. It, it's very unusual, and, and and certainly you know Keller's trial counsel said, "Gee, I can't believe we did that." You know, so I mean, he put it on himself. He didn't try and evade or, or or try and pass blame. He said, "Gee, I didn't really know what was going on, and you know, I didn't have my client read the stipulation or sign it, and so he's really putting it on himself." The only thing there is a complaint about is why didn't judge, the trial judge vacate the stipulation? I mean, there's case law saying that's the proper vehicle. He says in his order in the transcript, I know you really didn't know what the, tra the stipulation was. And so if both sides don't know what the stipulation is, then it's not voluntary, intelligently, and, and, and knowingly made. And, and so the stipulation should be vacated on those grounds alone. And, and I, I mean, it's certainly a very unusual Case. But until the 60B was denied, there really was nothing to appeal because the mistake was by Mr. Keller's trial counsel. If there's no other questions, I thank the court for its time. Thank you. Thank you. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a written opinion that will be sent to both sides. And uh, also, you can check on the Supreme Court website and our website. Thank you. Thank you.